finding out why the hospital was closed. And I said, well, we'd really like to know why the hospital was closed. We always met our targets. We were profitable. We were efficient. We saved lives. Yeah, you can tell us why the hospital was closed. That would be awesome. So uh, Holly found out, and in the book, Death of the Queen, revealed, and it was something that was a connection in our lives that was rather uh, obscure and a, a, a matter of serendipity. But when I was at Sierra Club of Canada, I had done an access to information request to get a report from the International Monetary Fund to the government of Canada from 1993 because I was looking for environmental content. Once I got that report, I put it up on our website so everybody could read it. And what it showed was that the International Monetary Fund in 1990, report to the government of Canada actually in 1994, had informed the government of Canada and those days we were considered a basket case economically, and John Strachan had just become Prime Minister. And we were told by the IMF that to retain our credit worthiness, we needed to do a number of things. We needed to uh, convert bursaries for students into interest-bearing student loans. We needed to close hospitals. We need to reduce funding to the CBC, via rail, the National Film Board. These were the things we needed to do to prove that we were credit worthy. And we did them all. Right? So one of the things that uh, Holly points out about wait lists in Canada, because I've been on the wait list for hip replacements since January, and some people will say to me, and they actually say it to me, I'm not kidding, why don't you go to the States and get a hip replacement faster? <laughs> and as Holly said, you know, the reason there's a wait list for knees and hips and things that aren't going to kill you while you wait, you'll be in pain. Okay, I have had some wine, so I've self-medicated this evening. <laughs> I'm in a lot less pain than I was on arrival, and that may be reflected in my speech. But the thing about the wait list in Canada is, I don't mind waiting. Because everybody in this country who needs a hip replacement is going to get one. And it doesn't matter if they can't afford it. And it doesn't matter if there's somebody who's a low income. And it doesn't matter if there's someone who has a job. I will wait. And I'm happy to wait. 
because I know that everybody in this country who needs a hip replacement is going to get one. And that is why I'm a really proud Canadian. And I keep wondering how it is that at the federal level, I mean, I tried it in the 2008 leaders' debate, throwing Stephen Harper's words at him in the leaders' debate, because I've memorized them from when he was the head of the National Citizens Coalition and spoke to a group in the United States. And he said, quote, Canada is a failed Northern European welfare state. Our proof of our inferiority as a nation is our pride in our health care system. But you know what? Stephen Harper's very, very clever. And he recognized something that I hadn't realized till I watched how he operates. You can give a speech, and as long as nobody's videotaping it, it'll never be used against you in the future. Because quoting someone never has the power of a videotape. So I'm being videotaped now, so goodness knows what Stephen Harper's going to do with that. <laughs> I was thrilled to hear Tim take us back to the Spadina Expressway. I did not know that was your entry into activism. But I plan to talk tonight, as much as I planned anything about tonight, I plan to talk about the power of one. And that takes me back to the Spadina Expressway story. I, the details of what I'm going to tell you now are in uh, one of my books. It, I, it's really one of my favorites. It, imagine not having my favorites of my own books. Is that not really bad? <laughs> you should be now. What kind of person is... I mean, my daughter would say, Mom, give it up. That's getting egotistical. But anyway, one of my favorite books that, that I wrote myself uh, is called How to Save the World in Your Spare Time. And in that book, I tell the story of Spadina Expressway as told me by two of the key players in that story. One was an activist, is an activist, who now owns a winery near Point Pele, is an activist named Bobby Speck. And Bobby told the story at a conference I attended, and I took a lot of notes and got her to help me with the story in my book. She was a young, almost mom, hugely pregnant, and she described it waddling to the microphone at various hearings because they decided in their neighborhood they did not want to use the Expressway. And a lot of the groups in the community who were traditionally respected neighborhood community groups told them, give it up. The Spadon Expressway is a done deal. We can't stop it now. And these people who refused to say no, she said, you know, her comparison was, her little, her little metaphor was that her little group of young and almost moms he said, we were like hobbits. We liked it in the Shire. We lived in our little neighborhood. And suddenly there was this thing threatening us, and we just decided to go forth and organize and try to change things. And from that experience, they managed to mobilize a movement in Toronto, spearheaded by people like Jane Jacobs and others who said, a neighborhood isn't a neighborhood without a human face. You know, it's, a city isn't bricks and mortar and God knows it isn't asphalt. It's people who know each other and care about each other's relationships. And that expressway will destroy our neighborhood and we're not going to allow it to happen. And it gets all odds. Tim and others mobilized a movement. Now here's where my second hero of the story comes in from a very different perspective than Bobby Speck. But I once worked, and I say this not as a full concession, but if you want to take it as a confessional moment, you may. I once worked in the government of Brian Mulroney. I was a nonpartisan, because I didn't belong to that party, and they let me work there anyway. I was the senior policy advisor to the Federal Minister of Environment. And at the point that there was no way to stop the logging on the southern third of the Queen Charlotte's Islands, which is Haida Gwaii, to protect that area to become Guayana's National Park, I was dispatched to try to convince Dalton Camp, who was then the, at the Privy Council office. Dalton Camp was the, you're, this audience, I'm thrilled, has so many people under 30. It has quite a lot under 25. Probably a lot of you never heard of Dalton Camp. And, 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 and everyone, who hasn't heard of Dalton Camp? Okay, good. <laughs> Dalton Camp was a progressive conservative. This is a species not only endangered but extinct in this country. 
Any progressive conservatives out there, your only recourse is to join the Greens. The, 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 was the person within the progressive conservatives who got rid of Sean Thief and Baker as leader. And Dalton Camp ended up, in the theory of this story, with Bobby Speck, he ended up as the chief speech writer to the premier at the time, Bill Davis, who was a conservative, progressive conservative. Now, when I went to see Dalton Camp, he actually was the person who made the difference so that we could stop the logging and save South Warrensby. He was the person who told Brian Mulroney that even though it was all hopeless and Bill Banner's dad had said they were going to log, that Brian Mulroney should call Bill Vanderson and convince him to change his mind. That's another story, but it worked. Meanwhile, back to Spadina Expressway, because I got to know Paul Kim, and I thought, and I adored him, but anyway, he would tell me lovely anecdotes about things he'd done that might have been considered good for the environment. And this story, which I tend to look on his face and doesn't know the story, is that Bill Davis said to Dalton Camp, I've got to make a decision about this Spadina Expressway. I don't know what I'm going to decide, so I need you to write two speeches for me. You write the speech where I approve the Spadina Expressway, and you write the speech where I refuse to approve the Spadina Expressway. And I need them both by next week. So Dalton told me the story. I said, you know, I gave him the speech, and I said, you know, Mr. Premier, Here's the speech where you refuse to approve the Spadina Expressway. And it's so damn good I didn't write you another one. <laughs> Which feeds in to what I was planning to say and what I wanted to talk about, which is the power of one, which is always the power of many. But it's also an affirmation that every single one of us, from where we are, with the skills we have, the powers we have, the talents we have, can make all the difference in the world. Bobby Speck, as a housewife who was pregnant, didn't think she could do much because she was new to politics and scared the hell out of her. I don't think, she never knew, I told her the story eventually, she never knew that someone with the powers to bring down John Diefenbaker had at the end of the day decided that's the right decision. I'm not writing letters to But together, and through their own individual talents without even talking to each other, they made one of the seminal decisions that makes Toronto a livable city. I mean, I know livability in Toronto is always a debate, and things are getting worse under the current We Don't Read Here team of the Ford Brothers. Uh, but, I mean, it is a little bit... It, it, Please, to God, this doesn't last. The city of Toronto is ruled by people who are against libraries? I, anyway, I, I digress. <laughs> the ability of a few people to change the world is something we don't talk about enough. We are, as an educated and media literate and politically savvy crowd, over and over again, I see people who know what's going on in the world decide that if there is global corporate rule, game over. It's too late for us to do anything about it. There's a media conglomerate, and it's all owned by the same four or five people. That's actually true, but there's nothing we can do about it. And all of that is wrong. The power of one person to change everything is empirically true. The power of many to change society is the thing that keeps me going because I know it's true. And when I know that one MP can change Parliament, I know one Queen MPP can change Queen's Park and can save Ontario.